well as for enterprises. There is a section that I am not presenting today that is not on the deck. It's going to be a, okay, if we have time. So you will find between slides 52 and 84, there's a big gap. So if you watch down here in the corner, you're gonna see a big jump in there. What I go through in that section is business model generation, which is how do you kind of build out a product. If you've gone from startup, you've got MVP, TML, and you know, then you've got to build that out a little bit further because that's an important part of it. I am skipping over that in the interest of time. When I have done this in my head, this is my first public presentation of this entire set of material. <coughs> this takes me about 35 minutes to run through both as I speak it out loud and as I run through my head. So I think this is going to fit well in this space. If we run long on time, I can go back to that material and just I want you to make a real clear mental break if I have to, if we do come back and insert that material. Um, and then I'll talk about those success patterns for scaling Agile up. This is not an intro to Agile. So I'm gonna go over Agile basics just to be sure that we've got a level set for anybody who's in the room um, because it then serves as a framework for a couple more frameworks that I then build on later in the presentation. Um, and I am honored that you all have chosen this as the session that you want to come to at this time. So Code Camp is rich, is super rich in material. Okay. I like to deliver value in the first 15 to 20 minutes of the presentation so that if you've got something else that you'd really rather go to or you decide that this is not a fit, cool. You've got the, you've got the essence of what I'm presenting and you can go get on to something that's a better use of your time. Like I said, I'm honored. Um, I am a big believer to unconferences in the two-foot rule. So if you're, you're not finding value, it's okay to use your two feet and leave. I am not offended at all. I'm honored that you came here in the first place. All I ask is that you respect everybody else who is saying and just you know, be quiet. Um, unlike my presentation yesterday, since I see a couple of familiar faces, this isn't a workshop. Um, there, I do believe there's time for questions, but I mean, there's not going to be exercises here. Okay. So I'm getting my mouse to wake back up. I'm really driving things nuts. Sorry about that. Um, well-known in Agile circles, pretty much wrote the book on using Scrum for Agile development. There's a quote that cited that he estimates less than half of the organizations using Scrum will get the results. They won't succeed in getting the benefits that they hope for from that. You ever ask yourself, why is that? Well, a key word in there is using, is using Scrum. There is a difference between doing Agile and being Agile. And what this is a talk about is how to be Agile. It's the how do you do it, the be of doing Agile. So it's kind of my Frank Sinatra talk. Okay. Doing Agile appears easy. It appears really easy. You can go read the Scrum papers in an afternoon. You can kind of get the, the principles in a one hour overview of a lot of different Agile methodologies. Being Agile takes discipline. What I'm going to cover here are some of the disciplines that I've uncovered in my 15 years of working in iterative methodologies. So here's the quick tool. Okay. As a frame up for the problem, Agile as a social technology, like any technology, is going through the law of diffusion. So you've seen this as Jeffrey Moore's chasm. Agile has worked really well in small teams. It's really worked really well in pilot projects and organizations. But when it gets into the larger organization or it tries to scale up, it's had a lot of problems. Now, Michael Sohota has a great paper on what it takes to do organizational transformation. A mistake that most people make is they think Agile is merely a process. It is both a process and a culture change. 
That has to be kept in mind. And what Sahota cites is culture eats strategy for lunch. So what's happening is as a, as a company grows, it grows across the chasm and it gets a little bit harder to run agile at scale. <coughs> you go from a pilot project into the larger organization, it goes across the chasm and it gets harder to scale. So one of the first key points, get the fundamentals solid. Get them absolutely solid as a first step. This is your pilot project. This is when you're a small team. Get the basics of the operation so that folks understand it. Work in the business is a phrase that I've heard both in multi-level marketing and holacracy. When I first came into this in February, brought that out. It's like, ah, they've got it right. There's a difference between operations and governance. Okay? Show the teams how to make the decisions. Because as you scale, leadership starts to get farther and farther away. When you're a small startup and you're seven or 10 or 30 people, everybody knows everybody. Everybody's wearing multiple hats. Everybody's got a shared idea of what's going on. But as you get bigger and bigger, you get farther away from that, and those teams may not be making decisions the way that you wanted them made as a leader. Show them how to make the decisions. Um, always, as a second point, look three iterations ahead. A lot of organizations just unconsciously, okay, what's the next step? How many of us actually have a career plan as a personal business? Think of it that way. Do you have an objective beyond uh, what's tomorrow's job, what's the next job? Are you thinking, where does this lead me? When you start to think to that third iteration, it informs the second iteration and confirms the first iteration, and it gets a whole lot easier, and I'll go through that in detail. It's very much like surfing waves riding a surfboard, managing the seas and the winds. <coughs> Ensure your teams know the purpose. This is huge, okay? As probably as big as working in the business and getting the fundamentals sound is ensure your teams know the purpose of the overall vision. One of the things Sinek does really well in this TEDx lecture is he points out when people believe what you believe, they will work with their blood and their sweat. If they don't believe what you believe, they're just going to work for the paycheck. What type of team members do you want? Okay. Fourth point, the role of the manager. Nature abhors a vacuum and Agile says nothing about what the role of the manager is, so give them something to do. There's actually some pointers that I'll have in here, uh, and I'll reference uh, Andrea Tomasini's work, which does a much better job than I think what I've outlined here, of incrementally how does that manager evolution go. The reason I'm basing what I've got in here is it's got a 30-year history, it's well-established in industry, so if you're facing a, a hierarchical implementation, it's, hey, here's something that you can kind of believe because it's got a long history. Final principle, see the whole. Come on, use, use what we all believe in. Use lean, look at the entire business, okay? Not many folks, when they're designing an organization, when they're designing a business, look at the way that things are going to fit together in the long term. They're built for that small startup team, but not for scale. So look at that whole, and just like you're looking at a product roadmap, look at where the whole business is going overall. Okay, so I'd like to get a little bit of calibration for the, the folks in the room. So I'd like to get an idea of what experience we already share. So show of hands, I'm gonna go through three different vectors, okay? So how many folks have run two teams, five teams, more than a dozen teams? Okay, cool. So for locations, how many folks have run two or more locations, five or more, three or more geographies? And by geographies, I mean 10 or more hours on, on a plane. Okay, cool. So for money, how many folks have run 100,000? A million? What? Money. For money? Uh, budgets? 
<laughs> Gross margin. <coughs> Successfully. Okay. Okay. So that's the type of scale that I want to talk about. So here's a little bit about my background. I kind of came to Agile in a need to do this for business survival environment. A hardware software business, consumer PCs at HP. That business had a 14-month design cycle and a three-month shelf life. When I started, we were only shipping six products a quarter. When I left that business about eight years later, we were shipping 200 products per quarter in Europe alone. Um, that business went from break-even when I joined it to, by the time I left it, a $4 billion top-line runway. So I'm talking about really large scale. We did all of that with weekly iterations of the plan, and one of the huge, huge benefits that was there was we did it with a single marketing deck that was an ASP and a single page spreadsheet that was the engineering plan of record. Now they controlled a lot of other information, but with that we had a snapshot of the entire business, the ASP and the response on a weekly basis. I knew at the time that that was incredibly powerful and I looked around for what sort of things we could use for that. Part of the reason I do have Business Model Canvas as kind of an optional portion that I'm not planning to show here today, but there is a presentation right after this on, on business models, um, not for me, from another speaker, um, is that Business Model Canvas is a way of looking at the whole business kind of like the marketing ask and iterating the business, which is a very, very powerful thing. What was the second you said that in the marketing ask that's like your best one? Marketing ask, engineering response. Engineering response, okay. okay. So we want, you're going to get. We want, you're going to get. So now I'm going to go through an incredibly brief orientation of Agile. Simply as a level set. Okay. Agile's big emphasis is inspect and adapt. Okay. So look at Agile as a really big domain. Probably the most popular methods are Scrum and Kanban. XP has a lot of commonality with that, but is a set of base practices that are inside of it. Lean is a pretty hot topic here in the Valley, especially because of Eric Ries and the Lean Startup. And in that, he kind of characterizes Lean as build, measure, learn. That's great. Um, there's a lot of commonality. There are some people who will say Lean is bigger than Agile, but some, there are some people who say that Lean is a part of Agile. And about that, I'm agnostic. I see a ton of commonality. In fact, if I go back to the Poppendike's work, they wrote some of the seminal books on Lean. Their introduction to it was really through manufacturing, and you can trace a lot of what goes on in Agile and Lean all the way back to Deming's work through the Toyota systems and into some of the more modern things like the Agile Manifesto. The Poppendikes outline seven principles that I've got all up here. The blue ones have a direct overlap with Agile. Scrum is a little bit more particular about talking about deciding as little as responsible. Now this was a key from the trenches that consumer PC business, we would iterate the entire product line, but we would not fix the final configurations on those PCs until eight weeks before they appeared in stores. So it was doing a whole lot of management of risk on the supply chain. Now in some instances, like for Thanksgiving, I can tell you from experience, all of the PCs that you're gonna see show up on Black Friday have probably already been manufactured and you haven't seen them advertised yet. And all they're doing now is fixing what the price is going to be on Thanksgiving. Okay. And that's why you see these leaks that come out on Black Friday sales is because they're finally communicating that information to the run to the to the presses so that they can press it out. And that's where some of those leaks come from. But really, when I was working in PCs, by the first couple of weeks of October, you were finishing your manufacturing in Asia, and things were getting on boats. They, the first stuff was already coming off of boats and, and clogging up the port of Long Beach to go out for distribution across the country. So deciding as late as possible is a real key in a hardware software business. And you're gonna see this later where I talk about where both Stagegate and Agile have their place. 
Okay, there's a widespread view, <coughs> especially in the Agile community, that waterfall is completely separate from Agile. The two don't meet. I have a different view. I see them as a strong overlap. And I do that with this orientation. This is a Stacy matrix. Stacy wrote this paper about decision making and he has two axes, certainty and agreement. And he talks about close to and far from. He talks about four different domains <coughs> for making decisions. The simple, the complicated that has two lobes, the complex and the chaotic. Okay, so I like to simplify this matrix a, a little bit just to make it easier to draw in many instances, especially when I'm whiteboarding, I change the axes to technology and requirements. So it's kind of like engineering and marketing, okay? I like to draw complicated as a, as a half moon instead of the two lobes, while still acknowledging there's that social political dimension as well as that experimental dimension. You can then look at the decision mechanisms that, that go in there. So way down in the simple, you have standards, you start to apply a little bit of expertise and negotiation as you come out into the complicated. You gotta get creative when you get into the complex and out in the chaotic, okay. Sometimes it's kind of every person for themselves. So some examples <coughs> that fit in here are when you're close to known, a technology that we can kind of all grasp and make simple decisions about is bicycles. As you get out into the complicated domain, you probably want to have a subject matter expert when you're repairing an airplane. Somebody who's been around the block, somebody who's got some over the shoulder. I'm gonna go all the way out to the chaotic now. This is a domain of emergency responders. Okay. Um, <coughs> think of fire, police, emergency rooms, battlefields. In fact, one of the works that I like to cite in terms of self-organized teams is a 1997 or 98 April, and I remember it was April issue of Inc. Magazine, Core Values, as in Marine Corps. And they talk about, is the Marine Corps Officer Candidate School the ultimate MBA? The Marines actually, in their warfighting manuals, have a principle of push decision making as far forward as possible. Because those are people in those chaotic environments who have the most information and can make the best decisions. Yeah. You'd think the military is very command and control. It is when it's on a peacetime footing. When it's on a wartime footing, it's very, very agile. And you'll find people that are coming out of battle training get at them because they've been in those chaotic environments. Okay, so let's map that to some operating practices. Um, best practice really fits for simple. Good practice where you've got some domain knowledge fits for the complicated. Emergent practice where you're trying to do new things kind of fits in the complex. And novel practice where you've really got to be creative fits way out in the chaotic. Mapping these to the common agile frameworks convolves <coughs> in a lot of chaotic situations. Think of help desk, okay? Think of any triaging system that you've got, like DevOps. Oh heck, that build server goes down. Yes. Probably going to operate more in a Kanban mode, okay? <clears throat> Versus waterfall, when you've got simple decision making, it works. If we've got to build a bridge, we've already got the technology. We already know how to do the social negotiations for where a bridge goes, okay? Waterfall fits. <clears throat> in my mind, it's just a certain case, okay, call it a corner case, of the Agile Canon. Agile and Scrum fits in this complex domain. Now, let me ask everybody, okay? Is technology getting more or less complex? More and more. Okay, great. Are markets getting more or less complex? It's more complex. Okay, so where does that point us to on the type of operating environment that we're going to be in? This is why Agile is gaining traction. We're actually getting into faster and faster movement. A book that I haven't cited in the reference links <laughs> is The Power of Pull by Hegel et al. It's a three author book. And it talks about how we've kind of moved as a society from a simple domain where, okay, you could go to school and you could trade on that degree forever. Okay? Into one that moves a little bit faster where 
the way I think of it is, okay, you've got to keep up with continuous learning, to we're actually going from stocks of information that you could trade on forever to flows of information. And it's like deal flow, like you might hear for people like on Shark Tank, like in real estate. It's all about connections and networking. This is one of the reasons why something like CodeCamp, why Silicon Valley is so key. It's because of the networks that we build here that we can move fast. We don't have to be the domain experts. We just need to know who the connections are to put them together. And as they say in real estate, <coughs> um, a little bit of something beats a whole lot of nothing. So keeping the whole deal to yourself instead of trying <coughs> it out so that it can move faster. Okay. That's a way that works when things are slow. But if things are moving fast, figuring out how to move fast and take just a little thin slice out of it is probably a different way. This is why Agile is catching on. Okay. So especially when you're in an adoption environment and when you're trying to go across cultures, think of where the culture is in terms of its decision making. This is a good framework to start. I'm so sorry. What was the difference between Kanban and Kanban? So Kanban, um, are you familiar with Agile? Okay. Okay. Terrific. I will do a very rapid walkthrough next on Kanban. Kanban is about um, work and process limits. Okay. And I will show a very specific difference about Kanban. Scrum is more about time boxing. They're just different ways of working in Agile. They're all about breaking work down, they're all about inspect and adapt, but they're just slightly different ways of working. Perfect, perfect segue. So just in case nobody in the room has ever heard of Waterfall, I want to calibrate us on that. All project management theory, including Agile, really has to look at the Iron Triangle. If you're not familiar with it, project management theory says, look, we really only got three variables. We've got schedule, scope, and resources with quality in the middle. If you squeeze one, you're going to have to adjust another. Okay? It's just a basis. Think about any project you've ever worked on. Okay, Waterfall, if you're not familiar with it, talks about having specific stages that you go through. Sometimes Waterfall is called stages. So you want to get everything all tied up nice and neatly before you move into the next stage. Like I said, waterfall fits when you're in a slow moving environment when you've already got close to none. Kanban, okay. So Kanban, let me go into just a little bit more detail because we're running out of day on time right now. Um, Kanban talks about having a board with different states of work. Kind of like waterfall has different stages but it's on a much smaller scale. You break the work down into work items, and a key distinguishing feature of Kanban is put work and process limits in place. Respect the work and process limits. Otherwise, you start to overload one part of the system or another, and lean is about looking at the overall system and maximizing flow through the system. How many people drive on the freeway in rush hour? So, um, what do you think is best for a freeway? Put as many cars through there as we possibly can fit at that hour, or keep them moving? Keep them moving. Keep them moving. Okay. And so we cool. have those lights. Exactly. Yeah. That's a work in process yes. limit that everybody can, can relate to, mm -hmm. is metering lights are a work in process limit for flow. You don't want to, we came up in an era of um, slower movement, simpler decision making, and in some ways, you could characterize it as an era of scarcity, where we didn't have all the resources that we do now, and we were looking for optimization of resources. Okay, we got plenty of resources. I heard somebody yesterday in a talk on funding for startups is like, um, there's enough deal flow for VCs that, okay, if they don't like it, fine, they'll take another one. So you can find money, there's plenty of ideas, it's all out there, it's a matter of how it fits together and what you want to do is optimize flow through the system rather than resource utilization. Work and process limits do a very good job of helping with that flow. I'll get into more detail later um, on how that applies at scale. Um, for Scrum, 
I'm not going to go through this. Scrum is a little bit more complex than, than uh, Kanban. Scrum has three specific roles of the team. Kanban only has the team. Okay? It has the product owner who owns the why, and the scrum master who's kind of like a coach or a referee that's there to protect the team and move things out. Where Kanban emphasizes scope, at, uh, Scrum emphasizes time. It really emphasizes the iteration that comes out. So here's a good comparison of the two. In a lot of project management, think of uh, constructing a house. Ever hear of scheduling cost overruns? Okay. Think of, um, I think the 787, when it came out, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, they had a little bit of a problem there. In a lot of classic project management that's run through waterfall, they try and constrain all four of these dimensions. One of the specific things about Agile is they make trade-offs. Okay. So Kanban makes a specific trade-off and says, we're going to optimize for quality and resources. Okay. We're going to commit to get this scope out. And as I was reviewing these slides last night, I think I'm going to modify this to say, commit scope and priority. Priority, okay. yeah because you may trade those priorities off, but the scope and the priority is always clear in Kanban. And you just accept the schedule. In Kanban, you don't say, it will come out on this day. You say, it will come out somewhere between here and here based on our past history. And here's how so things- it's not time box. Right, it's not time box. Okay, and what you do is you measure the cycle time through relative to the effort that you've estimated for that. So when new work comes in, you can kind of go, okay, it's about this big, our history says it's going to take us about this long. Versus Scrum, Scrum needs a slightly different set. Still optimizes for quality and resources, but commits to a schedule. We will get you something by this point in time. It may not be everything that you think it's going to be. Okay. So this is where you start to get to um, a minimum viable product and then iterate on it and start to improve it over time. So think of how Code Camp was five or six years ago when we were only on this half of campus and it was really, really crowded. Okay. With iterations time over time, this <coughs> as a product has gotten better. This is a key that I don't emphasize in this point, so you may want to take notes. A lot of Agile talks about, especially in Scrum, measuring effort. Puts a lot of, of emphasis on measuring the effort that the team's going to put in. Effort is freaking immaterial. Okay. What you really want to be measuring is velocity. Or sorry, is, is, is value. Sorry, value, not velocity. You want to be measuring value velocity, not effort velocity. Okay. A lot of businesses confuse priority with value. Okay. Priority is the combination of value and effort. It's actually value divided by effort. That then sets your priority. A lot of product owners that I encounter, well, here's the priority. Mm, okay, that's great. If you tease those two things out separately, which is one of the things I like to get teams to do, it makes a huge difference. And really what you want to do is steer the business to measuring the value that's getting delivered versus the effort. Each of these methodologies has value. Stagegate has value wherever things are relatively well known. If you're in a startup, think funding round. Okay. It's wherever there is a step function increase in risk. Or, and part of that risk is how much money you're putting out there. So think funding round as a really convenient analogy. Agile works really good where the problem or the solution and it's a little squishy, okay? And Agile is kind of where the team operates in between funding rounds. So think of how startups operate. Hey, we're gonna go get an A series, terrific. Now we're gonna go work on the problem. They come back to their, their capitalists. <coughs> say, okay, we thought the problem was this, and if you're familiar with uh, startup space and you hear about pivots, we really we realized it's way over here. So now our business is gonna go over there. Okay. So they've operated in an agile fashion, tuning to that, coming back to a stage gate to recalibrate. Okay, doing agile only appears easily. Okay. Being agile takes discipline. 
So now let's talk about what some of the disciplines are. This is, this is kind of where you marry up hierarchical management with agile rainbows and unicorns. So let's talk first about forming teams. Okay. Team isn't merely a group of people that are working together. Okay. A team truly is a group of people that trust each other. Okay. Go back to that military analogy. You've got a squad, a team that's out there doing something. You know, in fact, let me draw another military analogy. Who do you want to send in an entire Marine Corps or the Navy SEALs? The Navy Corps. <laughs> okay, well that's when you want to use force, but if you've got a lot of risk, the SEALs really operate on an agile, on an agile principle. Small, self-directed team, okay? And they intimately trust each other. Okay, when you're forming teams, I like to go back to Virginia Satir's work and overlay Bruce Tuckman's work of forming, storming, norming, and performing. And I like the two of these because <coughs> Bruce is really well known in project management circles versus with Virginia Satir goes into psychology. So really what we're dealing with as agilists is we're dealing with both kind of that hard side of doing a business and that squishy side. Remember, it's process and it's culture, okay? So human beings go through this. Whenever you're putting a new team together, that is a forming event, okay? Whenever you're teaching a new session or putting a new class together, it's a forming event. So there are things I do as a presenter to bring mm -hmm. us all together, like asking what's your experience, what are you, what are you looking for? That kind of level sets us and gets us out there. Okay, let's talk about a tech business and going through forming. So a lot of small startups, and I'm going to use that as an analogy <coughs> as I go through this. Kind of start out with a marketing founder and an engineering founder. They may have a team, okay? So there are certain roles that come in. There's often two to start, a CMO and a CTO. Um, the uh, Startup Genome Project is a really good thing to go look at. That's in the resource list. And they talk about success factors for startups forming. And one of the things they point to is uh, startups that are successful often have three founders, more so than two. So somewhere between two and three is optimal, more than four, okay, it's a little too squishy. Okay. I would posit, for reasons that you're gonna see later, that you wanna think of that third role as a COO. If you go dig around on Founders Institute, they have some really good stuff where, I think the guy out of Evernote is Philbin. I think he's the, one of the founders in there. And he talks about the VP of stuff in addition to your marketing and your technologist. And you'll get to see why I, I think that in a little bit. At the beginning, and even if it's a team that's inside of an organization, these things map. They can play any role at any time. Think of it in a startup wearing many hats, you're doing things back and forth. Over time, they will specialize. And over time, that CEO <coughs> will emerge. Notice I didn't say CEO at the start. Because when you're a three-person team, anyone can make the decisions and communicate it to everybody else because you've got really good tight mind share. Okay? Decisions are one of the first things you want to work on in any team. Okay? Decide how you're going to decide. I like to teach thumb voting with yeah. three states. Okay? I like to do it for multiple reasons. Thumb voting is a simultaneous reveal which eliminates subject matter expert bias. Think of how many times you've been in a meeting and you're going around serially on the table and you get to the VP and then people's opinions suddenly change. Okay? That's what happens when you do a serial reveal. When you do a simultaneous reveal, you get everything out on the table all at once. And it's like, I'm in, I'm in, I'm so in. Okay, I can support that. No, wait, stop. And I tell teams, the most important thing you can do, cool, time box the discussion, okay? So apply time box. We're only gonna talk about this for half an hour, then we're gonna take a vote. This cuts off endless discussion. You know, bing, timer goes off, what's the vote? If everybody's in agreement, you're blowing air, okay? If everybody's in agreement or can support, you're blowing air, move on, okay? You gotta move fast. <clears throat> if you get a no, it's not cool, what do we miss? Great, figure out what that is, have a tiebreaker. Okay, somebody's gonna need to make the decision. This is also important. Even if somebody is still, no wait, stop after your second vote. If you've got that tiebreaker, psychologically, okay, so part of that culture, psychologically, they will support the decision. Okay, if people's voice hasn't been heard, 
oftentimes mm, not going to support the decision. They're going to be a little resistant. I think that's a good, very good point. I never thought that way. Never thought about it. Let me, let me just make this last point and then I will take that question. The key, show the team how to make the decisions. This is one of the keys from the trenches that we knew how to make the decisions that management wanted to make and 90 to 95% of the time on those weekly reviews, they just went <laughs> rubber stamp. Okay, occasionally they go, oh, did you consider this? No, and then we have, this is the first real key. Teach the teams how to make decisions. Do you have questions? You're talking about the decision making with the phone, but are you talking about teams or are you talking about decisions between the CMO and the CTO? Um, this can apply at any level. It really can apply whenever you've got a group that's making a decision. Whoever's in power can make that decision. Um, I'm talking about if you're a startup, you've probably only got three roles. Right. Okay. So if, if you're a startup, that's a great way to make decisions. Sometimes you get into an analysis paralysis because you're just so enamored of the problem. That's great. Move on. You're burning cash. Question. Uh, I guess the problem I see is sometimes like there's lots of discussion, but no one's really formulated a question, so you kind of have to have that. Call it. Okay. That's why you, that's why you put the time box in. Let me give you a warning. This is a 147 slide deck, and I'm on slide 47. <laughs> so, Case in if, point. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> if, 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 if I, cut out for like 20 or 30 slides. No, I'm going to talk really, really fast. <laughs> but the, 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 the 147 is even after I cut, cut out the 30 slides. So you're going to be in the auction mode. Yeah. <clears throat> OK. So let's talk about storming and norming. So whenever you've got a team, you're probably going to have meetings. Who likes meetings? OK. They probably all write a book about it. In fact, there's really a great book about it. Yeah. Okay. It's truly, truly a great book. What Lencioni says in this book is we have so many meetings that we really ought to get better at them. Okay. Most people run meetings as if there's only one type. Lencioni actually goes and teases out there's four different types of daily check-in, a weekly tactical, a monthly strategic, and a quarterly retreat. There's a strong parallel to Scrum. I came to Lencioni before I was formally trained in Agile. I went back to him as I was trying to distill some of this stuff about three years ago. I went, oh my gosh, he's saying exactly the same thing. That's way cool. He's a management trainer who's based out of Santa Rosa or Marin up in North Bay. Um, meetings really are how we accomplish work as a team. One of the strengths from the trenches <coughs> is how we ran meetings. So I can walk into any meeting anytime and here's my stock agenda. I don't have to even know the topics walking into the room. So a couple of keys about this, get the hot topics out on the table first, then decide the priority, okay? Then set time boxes around what you're gonna do, moving from the strategic and longer term to the tactical and shorter term to next steps. Always do less than what you've got for the time box of available time, and part of that is for ground rules as a team. So stop on time, okay, stop on time. People are busy, great. Set the expectation, we will start on time so that we can stop on time. And as a corollary, it's okay to be late. Don't make it wrong. Everybody's doing the best that they can. They've got a lot of meetings, okay? But if you're late, it's your job to catch up to the conversation. Okay. How many of us have been in meetings where somebody comes in eight minutes late and goes, okay, what's going on? And everybody has to hear it for the third time. Yeah. If you set this expectation out front, people come in, they keep their laptop shut, they pay attention until they know that they're plugged in, cool. It's also okay to work with your laptop in my meetings, okay? Because three seconds of silence implies consent. If I call a question, I'll call your name out, okay? If you don't respond, I'm presuming the answer and we're moving. And I set that expectation up front and it helps to keep things moving fast. For the advanced, I like to talk about Picard beats Kirk. These are two different leadership styles. Kirk was a very participative leader. He went with landing parties. Picard was a very delegative leader. He wanted recommendations and sent away teams. So wherever possible, teach your teams to synthesize the information, propose the alternates and the solutions. It's gonna make their decision making a whole lot easier. Okay, initially with Agile, things are really close. Okay, and you want to work in the business to really get those fundamentals sound. You want to teach teams <coughs> how to make decisions, okay? This is where I skipped. 
question, but work in the business, you've shown that a couple of times. What's the opposite of that? Sorry? What's the opposite of a complementary state of not working in the business? I'm just trying to understand the phrase. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? I, will, I will come in a couple of slides okay, to something like this, and you'll see it in blue and red. If you still have that question when I get there, and it'll be up at the top yeah, of the slide. Yeah, the contract. Yeah. If, 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 if you still, when you see it at the top of the slide, if you still have that question, let me know. Okay? So, how do you go big instead of go home? This was part of my promise. Okay, commonly in Agile, in a multi-team practice, you'll see things like Scrum of Scrums. A couple of, honestly, pretty decent practices are to have a product owner council to balance things as that vision and theme starts to get a little bit away from single team. You may have a chief product owner, okay? That's okay, but when I hear folks as steeped in Agile as Rally, as recently as in the past 15 months, come in and make a presentation and go, oh, well, you, okay, you wanna scale Agile, well, you do Scrum of Scrums, and then you do uh, Scrum of Scrums, which like, sounds an awful lot like hierarchical management to me. My experience is a little bit different. Okay, remember law of diffusion as a social technology. Okay, agile goes through the chasm. Okay, in small teams, it's over there with the early adopters who are passionate who will pay any price. That's why it works. Okay, that's why it works in pilot teams. As it comes across, you've got to get to a different mindset. Okay, Steve Blank has some really great parallels. He talks about startups being like air-to-air -air combat. And he talks about run rate businesses being like airlines. They're both pilots, they're both planes. Uh, why, why can't we take the airline pilot and put it on the air combat? Okay? <laughs> Different types of environments. He then overlays that the, the role early on is search for a scalable business model. Okay? Then you build it and then you grow it once you've got an established business model. The same thing <laughs> happens in Agile. You're actually figuring out how to get it in as a pilot and then you need to bring it across the organization. Okay, parallel description that came out of my days at HP, they would talk about management leadership styles, general managers as being either cowboys or farmers. Okay, kind of fits in different ends of the spectrum, and my role in that PC business was really as a sheriff, and that was a big clue. I love the chasm, because I recognize that there are so few people that know how to get across it. And having been across it, I think it's actually a very repeatable process and Agile points us in that way. Remember, doing Agile appears easy, being, being Agile takes some discipline. So let's talk about that second discipline, scaling out the product plan. You really want to look to um, three different waves as you go out on the product plan. So you want to look beyond what you're currently doing and what you plan to do next. And they really are like waves of products and ranges of where the market or the technology could go because it's getting less certain. Okay. It's like surfing. When you're surfing, you're kind of managing this cone of momentum. Okay. You're not gonna get all the way over there, but you're managing it as you go along. So what you really wanna do is manage that cone of momentum because whenever your objectives creep outside of it, that's where your risk creeps in. And if you just unconsciously move forward, which is what a lot of teams do, it's like, okay, we've done this, we're gonna do this. A lot of us do this in our careers, I have, okay? That unchecked momentum adds the risk, and what happens is all of a sudden something changes, <coughs> and now it's outside your cone of momentum, and you've got a really short timeline pressure that you've gotta deal with. So when you start to think of three iterations, and you start to clue the team into this, see where that's likely to go, they'll start making better decisions. They go, oh, you want to get their three iterations out. We're going to design this for that instead of we were thinking over here. Okay. You really want to do that. Because same thing, you look out at a third iteration, even if it's a guess, if it's your best guess, and you adjust the second <coughs> iteration to fit to it, when that third iteration changes, you can still fit it inside that cone of risk that you're managing. Okay, initially with Agile, you work in the business and you get the fundamental sound. As those visions and themes expand, okay, you want to anticipate where the technology and the market is going, okay, and you want to work on the business. Okay, that's the difference between working in the business and working on the business. You want to start anticipating where things are 
and really managing a whole portfolio. Yeah. It's kind of the difference between tactics and so governments. Yes. Governments. Can I go back to your plane pilot analogy? Yeah. So when you're the combat pilot in the business, you're just in the middle of the combat <coughs> in the air ball that you're trying to shoot down the airplane. Now when you're going to become a commercial pilot or you run a commercial airline, you think about okay, where are my hubs, where do I spoke to versus the actual flying from city A to city B. Right. Is that working on the business versus that of working in the business? Yes. So working in the business is, oh, hey, we've got some bumpy air, even if you're a commercial airline flight, okay? Good. okay? Right. You know, working on the business is where do we want to put our hubs, where's our demand? Right, where do we need to stage right. our pilot resources, et cetera, to optimize right. flow, deal flow, or whatever. When we start, we've just got, hey, here's a really cool product idea, okay? But if we start to anticipate where the business is going to be and really start to get farther out, we're going to, we're going to pave a road that our teams can run down. key as you do this is give the teams the why, okay? When they understand the why, they're going to understand the greater pattern. So now we're applying a lean principle of seeing the whole. See, um, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. They don't buy your plan, they buy your dream, okay? So, now let's talk about, you've got great, fundamentally sound team, you've got a roadmap with three iterations, the team grasps the why, they're making good decisions. How do you grow the entire business to scale? So let's take restaurants as an example because everybody can wrap their head around it and it gives us some time. So you start out as a small mom and pop restaurant, you may have someone who's waiting tables, someone who's back cooking, you may have a little bit of staff. You get to some role separation over time as things get bigger, and we've got an analogy in the restaurant business of front of house, back of house. As they get larger, okay, you still get more roles that come in, and coordinating those, more, those greater set of roles is actually a pretty complex problem. So what restaurants do is they scale by abstracting the pattern. They have folks who become specialists in each area in that front of house, back of house, okay, and they have domains. Now this is really interesting. How many mom and pop restaurants actually succeed when they go to a second location? So let's talk about going really big instead of going home. Okay, so great, we know what the pattern is, we overlay that where we start, we grow it out. Oh wait, we've got more locations. There's stuff that's falling outside this domain expertise. We designed that initial organization really to start. We forgot there's going to be this run dimension. This is another key when you're designing a business. Okay. I'll talk about this in a little bit with technology business. Okay, so here's the technology business, marketing engineering, you've got a team, it gets bigger, coordinating it's complex. Okay, so you scale by abstracting the pattern. A lot of times I've seen that we've got, well, an SVP of marketing, we've got an SVP of engineering, and we kind of treat all of this stuff as part of engineering. That's the start, okay? Running is different, okay? When you recognize that this is a pattern as a business goes out over scale, and from the trenches, I was able to work that $4 billion business by talking to five to 10 people on a weekly basis. That was it. This is, this is the clue, is you understand this pattern. I knew what those five roles were, and it took me several years to kind of when you hire, do you want the white hot engineer? Okay. When you hire a white hot engineer, they're only going to be out over here. But if you recognize this as the pattern, maybe what you do is you bring somebody in who's got some operational skills so that you've got some range to come in. Okay. When you hire a manager, same sort of a thing. Do you want to hire for those specialized skills or do you want to hire for somebody who's got some flexibility and adaptability, especially if you're doing agile? So you may make some compromises to optimizing resource utilization, okay? So you want to apply lean and see the whole from the very beginning. And you want to scale through synthesizing. So part of the reason that I was able to tactically control that business with two documents and 
five to 10 people, was we had domain experts who kind of then leveraged teams in this area. Okay. What I was at HP was called a system manager. Okay, and this is where you start to see some strong parallels to Leffingwell's work in the Scaled Agile Framework, yeah. is you really want to have a, this is where he lit rockets off for me when he talked about having a system team. You want to have a system team that in many ways is like a scrum master for those multiple teams, that is protecting those teams from management thrashing, okay, but is still smoothing that roadmap into them. And you want to be working on multiple releases over time. So the team may be delivering this release while you're planning this one, while you're anticipating this one. Uh, Mike Kottemeyer gave a very good presentation that's linked here that's in the resource list at Scrum Gathering this past May. And he overlays this. And it's beautiful because this is a way that you can marry Agile to hierarchical management. You want to use flow across the system and you actually want to apply it in layers like this. I <clears throat> talk about it in terms of operate, anticipate, coordinate. And that is the strategy that I typically use coming in raw if I don't have any other information. Get the fundamental sound, start to anticipate the business, start to coordinate the whole. Okay, so Mike talks this through that Kanban creates a whole system, okay, to create that work in, in flow. And to the top tiers, these really appear like stage gates, which is what they've been trained in, which is what they're used to and what they're very comfortable with. And that lends itself to a weekly governance practice of, hey, what's your status report? This is kind of what the management view is up versus this is the layer that we operate in as agiles. This is small single team. This is small pilot team that, ah, okay, it's an investment we don't, when you start to scale it up, this is what management wants to see. That gives the team the protection to still be agile. Well, to management, it appears you're doing agile. Okay? This goes all the way from a story being ready to work to in process, and you start to bring new flow work into the system to continuing ongoing grooming on a weekly basis to continue that flow, allowing even new, newer work to enter the flow stream and task breakdown to emerge over time for the team. So the team is still working on these tasks while in weekly grooming, they're emerging the new work that comes out. So when a story gets to done or test ready, <coughs> it starts to pull even newer work through the stream and then out into deployment or general availability. Now, since I've worked in a hardware software business and from posting the slide deck, I've gotten a couple of people who ping me and said, could you come in and talk to our major multinational corporation about some of this stuff in hardware software? Um, let me overlay very quickly some, some hardware on top of this. Hardware kind of has this, it's got more latency. Think of this as um, PVT, DVT, EVT. Engineering validation prototype, development validation prototype, production validation prototype. You're still working with, wow, three iterations. Remember that? Three iterations. It applies in hardware as well. Okay? It applies when you're doing release planning. You may be getting ready to go through a design gate review or into GA. You want to be doing that looking out to that third iteration and steering that cone of momentum. You may make slightly different tweaks as you're about to release to set you up and track those plans in process. Okay, so a key at seeing the whole is to coordinate the whole system, okay? Now, when you're running a bunch of teams, you wanna go through decision delegation. Um, a really well-established decision delegation mechanism in business is RACI or DACI, Responsible, Accountable, um, Responsible, accountable, consultant, and influence. Okay. Now, Daisy just puts slightly different labels on it. Okay, they talk about decider, accountable. The red is kind of your control point. In agile terms, it's a single neck. To, I mean, hand to shake. Okay. Yellow does the work. Black is your subject matter experts. Blue thinks their opinion matters, but just needs to know 
like that song. <laughs> 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 And sometimes your stakeholders are blue. They don't like hearing it. Typically, you've got everything all bunched up. Ideally, you really want to get them separated far out. Especially, you want to get them <coughs> informed, very distinct. Practically, you'll have some overlap. Get accountable, separate from consultant, and make sure that you get informed, very well separated. Here is an example from hardware, software, high mix, product lifecycle driven environment that operated with weekly iterations. Okay. I talk across the top of the page about the various gates that I went through and the multiple teams that were being coordinated. And you can kind of see just by the colors on the chart, at any one point there's only one red. Okay. There might be overlap between responsible and then red kind of dominates instead of yellow. Okay. But this makes it really clear who's doing what when as you go through those stage gates. A lot of blacks. A lot of blacks and a lot of blues. Yes. Okay. And you, you want to get that very clearly distinguished. Very clearly distinguished. You also want to reward action over opinion. And you always want to prioritize results over process. Okay. That's so, a big point. So I, you know, because of my experience, you will pry Agile out of my poor dead fingers. I'm just a true believer in Agile, but I also recognize reality. There are higher principles than Agile. Business, if we don't have a business, it doesn't matter what process we use, okay? For business, customer. If we don't have to lie to customers, it doesn't matter. So I will compromise some of what Agile says for the business just to thrive, for customers to be delighted. <coughs> Delegation boards are something that is emerging in the Agile space from Jurgen Apollo. I think it's brilliant. So he talks about seven different layers of delegation. So as you're starting to let the teams decide, um, you, you can actually map out what decisions they are allowed to make versus the ones that they've got to get permission on. And he maps this out in seven different layers. I have a great deck from him in the resource list. Here's an example of a delegation board that's really pretty simple. And the team may not get to self-select. It may be here. You guys need to work together. Okay? But they may be able to name their team within limits. Probably don't want any profanity there. Okay? okay. You know, how they document things, entirely up to them. Okay. This is a great way to make it very transparent, one of the agile values to the team of what their limits are and what they can operate with. It's an alternative to racy daisies. Racy daisies, a little bit more ponderous, but it is very well established. Okay. This is emerging. Okay, let's talk about evolving the manager's role. This was kind of the catalyst for me pulling this presentation together. <coughs> like I said as I started, um, Liz Adkins came through about 15 months ago. Someone said, What's the role of the manager in Agile? She said, uh, I don't know. It, she was much better than that. Yeah, yeah. But what went through my head at that point is, uh oh, that's a problem. See, Agile, as what she said is, Agile doesn't say anything specifically about the manager's role. <clears throat> if all of a sudden your job went away, wouldn't you be a little concerned? This is why we see managers kind of try and jump into the role of Scrum Master, try and jump into the role of Product Owner as they go into an organization, because it's a vacuum and they're a little afraid. So the way that you take away fear is you give certainty. Okay? Nature abhors a vacuum. Nature will fill it. Those folks will jump in. So what I like to do, because it's very well established, is talk about situational leadership yes. as a way to get managers from where they are, yes. where they've been classically trained, to where they need to be. And I'm passionate about this because it literally saved my career. I was a very directive, delegated manager. I didn't understand the support dimension that's covered in this. And when I learned it, it made a world of difference. Okay, this is a nice, complete diagram of situational leadership. Yep. One of the resource links that I point to is the wiki, the Wikipedia entry, where you can go for a lot more information. I'm going to do a very brief walk. As I said at the beginning, I found some stuff only on Friday that actually does a nice job of talking about how to walk managers through this from a hierarchical to a truly agile environment from Andrea Tomasini out of Agile 42. It's in the resource links. Okay. Characteristics, there's four different areas that are in um, situational leadership. There's a 
direction vector and a support vector. Okay, people start out in high direction. I made the team. Cool, give me 10 push-ups. Okay, and keep coach. No matter what I do, it's just not working. You're doing great. A little bit of support. Now, run 10 laps and some direction. Okay, to, you know, coach, how do I pitch this guy? When I was pitching, says Dave Rigetti, and that's mentoring. Okay, to finally, cool. Now you know it. Now you can, you can delegate. If you just think they know what they're doing and you back off, they hit this plateau, you see they're not doing, you come back in and you get inside their shorts and direct, and they go nuts. Okay, and that's what happened to me. When I learned this and I started to walk people through this, made a world of difference in my career. <coughs> you can also use this as a follower. You can also use this with your stakeholders and start asking, I'm just curious, would it be okay if, and you can start drawing them back up the curve. Okay, some characteristics, conversations from a manager or in direction are I talk, I decide, we talk, I decide, we talk, you decide, you decide, I trust you. It moves followers from task and output to result and outcome. Outcomes trump outputs. This is why managing effort is really kind of futile and managing value is really what you want to be measuring. So really, when you think about this, great leaders give us something to believe in. When you believe in something, you're going to give it your all. Okay. The YouTube video with Sinek is well worth your time. I watch it at least once a year. Um, in fact, in the resource links, I've given him a second lecture of his that's another 20 minutes, and I watch that once a year as well. Um, <coughs> if you don't give people something to believe in, they're just going to have something to do, and they're just going to work for this. Okay. So one of the goals of Agile fits very well with situational leadership, and it's to get teams okay, into a fully self-directed team. Okay. That's the promise of Agile, <coughs> that higher management wants they want greater productivity by not having to get down into the weeds. Every executive manager I've ever dealt with would love to get out of the weeds. But they think they can't because their teams are wait, not making the decisions they think they should. They didn't walk them through the curve and teach them how to make the decisions because they didn't give them the perspective because they didn't give them the why. Okay? Now what you can position this for managers as is um, when Agile is well running, it actually liberates you for higher value, higher scope Absolutely. work. It's not taking anything away. You actually get to do more cool stuff. Now, if you really like doing the weeds, maybe you don't want to be a manager. Maybe you need to create a technical ladder that recognizes that capability. Do you have a question? Yeah, the point of the higher manager moving the team to that that's part of the whole department. You know, whenever somebody comes into a team, they'll start here. Whenever a new team, a new business forms, it'll start here. As a leader, you want to move individuals, you want to move entire teams over here. <coughs> when you, as an agilist, when I come into an environment, a lot of business is over here because this is where we work. And it's a matter of moving an entire business, which may be several hundred people through that. Do you have another question? No, I was going to comment. You mentioned it's agile for the process and the culture. The yes. culture process has been the heart and push. I prefer the word more challenging. <laughs> right. and, and it's underestimated. This is, this is where agilists have rainbows and unicorns as an appearance. And a danger is executives make it, oh, you're organizational development, we're going to yeah, kind of push position you with HR. There's a ton of power, okay, a ton of power in culture. The Sahota paper that I referenced in the, in the resource links talks about how you can map different cultures using the Snyder culture model, and he talks about different techniques for how to move things over, and the key sound bite that he's got in there is culture eats strategy for lunch. Okay, A manager's job is really to establish the culture. Managers think their job is to That's produce right. output. Okay, It's to produce a culture. Okay, cool, we're running really good on time because I'm now into the home stretch. Here's the summary. <coughs> Agile 
like any technology, it's a social technology, it goes through the chasm, whether you're starting it up as a small business or you're bringing it in as a pilot project. I posit that Agile itself, as Agilus, is going through the chasm because of the amount of pull that we're seeing for adoption. And it's going through the chasm. We need design patterns that take us across the chasm and that scale things up. So from my experience, five key points, okay? Get the fundamentals sound, okay? Work on the business so the teams know what they're doing. Teach them how to make decisions. There's multiple different decision-making methodologies that you can use. You can have a veto power, it's okay, okay? Always look three iterations ahead and be transparent. Communicate that to the team. How many of us have been in startups? Okay, cool. How many of us have like come in the next day and it's like, no, we're no longer in that business, we're in this business? Okay, cool. That's somebody just found something outside that cone of momentum. If you communicate that to the team, in fact, if you show them this as a design pattern, that you may eventually find something that's outside of that and it may come in and maybe a head snap for you, they'll be able to cope with that head snap when you suddenly change directions, okay? Have the team grasp the why by understanding both where you're headed and why you're headed there, they're going to be better positioned to execute and make the decisions that you want made. This is where you start to work on the business, and you'll probably work both on the business and in the business as things grow. You want to evolve the role of managers, and again, the Tomasini paper I think does a really good job. Situational leadership is great because it's got 30 years of data Nothing beats data when you've got resistance, okay? Um, you want to coordinate the entire system. This is a big, <coughs> big lever, okay? You want to operate the entire system and it's got a lot of moving pieces. I've drawn the diagram this way because I find the scaled agile framework is really complex. It is. This is, this is a simplified diagram that captures the essence of what I think he's getting at shows where the key lever points are, okay? You wanna do that including decision making, whether you do it through a racy daisy chart or you do it through delegation boards. Delegation boards are great at the team level. A racy daisy chart is great more at an organizational level, okay? And always, you really, really want to see the whole. You wanna see where you're going, you want to be making decisions based on this entire design pattern versus where you are at that moment, including your hiring, both of your technical competencies and your managerial competencies. Okay, <coughs> I drew on a ton of resources. They don't all fit on a single page. Okay, and rather than putting links directly in, what I've done is I've created a bit.ly bundle that's really easy to remember for a lot of this source material. Um, as I said, I've also got this posted on my SlideShare account, and it is linked into what you'll find here at CodeCamp. So if you want to get a copy of this deck, you can download this deck. And I was, I'm glad I cut out those 30 slides, because I'm running out of time. Um, but those 30 slides really start to talk about business model generation and the business model canvas. I've got a bunch of links in the resource links on that. Um, for some design patterns, um, holacracy is something that's very new. I only came across it in February. It's very, very interesting about how they treat this. And they, they talk about a couple of key features on decision making um, and on delegation of authority that I think are missing from the typical Agile canon. Um, scaled Agile framework I find a bit prescriptive, and that's okay in some places. Okay? It's not a personal fit with me, but I can work with it. Um, Spotify has a great paper on how they use Agile in a, um, that they matrix everything across multiple locations by both skill and the typical product that they're working on. I'm not talking about product management, I'm talking about the actual product that they ship. Okay? Remember, doing Agile only appears in these things. What you really want to focus on is being Agile, and that requires a little discipline, which is a little contrary to where a lot of Agile thought is. Okay. If you'd like help or know someone who'd like help accelerating their genius, my name is Bernie Maloney. I'd be happy to talk to them. You can find me on LinkedIn, on SlideShare, on Twitter as Bernie Maloney. If you need an email for me, I post one publicly on my LinkedIn profile rather than giving it out. If you'd like follow-up, 
please leave me your information and I'll be happy to follow up with you. Okay? Now, I like to get feedback. SBCC asks that you go and fill feedback forms in our presentation. I love it because that helps me figure out how to get better. Okay? So as you think backwards to your decision to spend your precious time here this morning, okay? So did I fail, meet, or exceed your expectations? Thumbs up. Okay, cool. Do I have anybody with thumbs down? Because you're the people I really want to learn from. Okay, and, and, and if you're just saying this to be polite, no, no, come on, I like the harsh reality, okay? So if I sucked, I want to know it. Okay, great. As you're thinking forward, because I talk, um, if I'm giving this presentation again, your friend hears, hey, heard this guy talk, you know, and he's talking on a subject, I think he went to that, would you tell them to avoid, consider, or must attend? Okay, and again, you know, if you're just saying this to be nice and you're really this way, come talk to me. I'd love to learn from you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I am honored by your